All right, so by also way of introduction, I'm, I'm Marge Seabrook. I want to thank Don DePetty for being so kind uh, and asking me to come and speak to you. He, he did this about, I don't know, five or six months ago. It sounded like a real good thing then. Uh, <laughs> but in the last week or so, I'm not so sure. I also want to commend Jennifer Price. Uh, I've spent uh, more time with her on the phone than uh, my nurse uh, as well. So uh, thanks very much uh, for, your, for your help and your invitation and your hospitality. So by way of background, I grew up in Anderson. So let me get a sense. Who's from South Carolina here? Okay, who's from an adjoining state, North Carolina or Georgia? And then pass there? Yeah, well, welcome. We, we, this is, uh, we're glad to have you in, uh, uh, in Charleston. Uh, I, um, I grew up in Anderson. So Anderson is not far from Clemson. So if you know South Carolina, uh, it's in the upper part of the state. Now, I actually went to high school um, with radio. I don't know if you remember the 2003 movie by that name, Radio. He was actually at the high school where, where I was, which is T.L. Hannah. I really did not think that was that I knowing radio was going to be important to me uh, 40 years after graduating from, uh, from high school, but uh, that's, that's kind of the claim to fame in our area. I graduated from Walker, then came to medical school, and I've been in Columbia ever since then. Got a wife of 34 years. I have three children. My oldest is actually a GI fellow uh, down here in, in Charleston. Now, I, I like college football. I don't lose sleep over what happens in any games. Um, I, growing up in Anderson near Clemson and then living in Columbia, um, I always am happy for both teams to win. Um, and so I'm, I'm usually at least partially happy uh, most, most seasons right now. I'm in private practice. Um, I, get, I grew up gastroenterologist. There's, there's nine of us uh, in a practice in the Midlands. Uh, we have two outpatient endoscopy centers, uh, and, um, and seeing patients every day uh, is what I do. I was in the hospital this morning uh, making rounds, and then did a few procedures before coming down here. Now, I did my training between 1989 and 1991, and there are a few of you who lived through those years as well. And it, I don't know if it was a magical time in everybody's specialty. It was certainly a magical time in GI. Four amazing things happened during those two years. First, the idea of Helicobacter pylori uh, was being first kind of caught on and introduced. Hepatitis C virus was identified during that period of time. Video endoscopy was just now being introduced. And we used to look through this lens or through this long tube, and it was very difficult to see. Uh, and, um, and so that, that revolutionized, at least that visualization of the digestive tract. And a new medication was introduced by the name of Prilosec. So a lot of things happened that revolutionized GI back then. So it, with that as a background, and when I, when I thought about this talk, I said, well, I know a little bit about a lot of things in the digestive tract, so I'll try to, what I went through was mostly looking through the uh, American College of Gastroenterology, the American Gastroenterology, uh, Gastroenterological Association guidelines at different diseases and different uh, disease processes. So I'm going to go pretty fast. I'm going to go uh, at a pretty high level, um, and then I'll be happy to take, I'm probably not, uh, I'll be happy to take uh, questions at the end if you like. I'm not going to discuss the pancreas because everybody hates the pancreas. Um, I am not going to talk about inflammatory bowel disease because that is uh, hours of lecture, but let me say two things about both of those. If you're in the emergency room, which some of you are, please, the most important thing with somebody coming in with pancreatitis is what? Flooding them with lactated ringers. Just, if you just open up a bag of LR, please do that until the uh, other folks are called. That is the most important thing uh, from a hyperperfusion standpoint that we can do to mitigate the, the complications of pancreatitis. As far as inflammatory bowel disease goes, um, clearly the, the move now is kind of more of a top-down treatment, uh, which is with the biologic agents, uh, to keep people in steroid-free remissions uh, long-term to prevent, to prevent complications. All right, so the goals. We're going to talk about some common digestive uh, disorders. We're going to review the recommendations. Most of it, a lot of it's expert opinion, but a lot of it's from guidelines. Um, I have no stinking disclosure. I would love to tell you that I had all these wonderful disclosures, but I have absolutely none. Uh, except that uh, I must disclose the fact that I did grow up in, in public education in South Carolina, so that puts me a little bit of a deficit of case. So, all right, from a digestive geography standpoint, we're going to start at the top. We're going to go through. I'm going to touch on uh, two or three things in each of these areas. Uh, again, a high level uh, flying fast. So, we. Gastroesophageal reflux, 
clearly the most common thing that a gastroenterologist is going to see and is a primary care physician. How many people is that? Seven, uh, seven training I see, primary care, a few, handful. Okay, so y'all see it, you'll see it there as well. 10 to 20% of the Western world will complain of reflux. 6% of the Western world will have bothersome reflux. Lots of people, uh, lots of symptoms. Typical symptoms, heartburn, regurgitation, you don't need to uh, be a gastroenterologist to be treating that. Uh, those people need uh, uh, lifestyle modification, which nobody wants to do. It is so difficult to watch what you eat. It is so difficult to avoid uh, foods uh, that cause reflux. Now, and my advice to these folks is very easy. The reflux diet is a breeze. If you like it, do not eat it. Uh, so that's, uh, and that's, but that is very hard for people to comprehend. And so putting these folks on PPIs for a couple of months is very reasonable. Uh, I love to talk about de-escalating uh, or uh, rock, rocking down on medications. I love to talk on anticoagulants because gastroenterologists hate blood thinners, cardiologists love them. Uh, I like trying to reduce medications uh, as well. There are atypical presentations uh, of reflux, uh, and those are uh, chest pain, uh, maybe typical or atypical. They need a cardiac evaluation first. And then there's uh, anything from dental erosions, uh, neck pain, sore throat, hoarseness, even sinusitis. So and it can overlap with reflux with a lot of other uh, epigastric discomfort uh, as well. Uh, but typical reflux uh, is the regurgitation and, and burning. When do we get involved as gastroenterologists? Do they, does everybody need an endoscopy? No. In fact, if you're, uh, especially if you're relatively young, uh, folks that don't have alarm symptoms, which are uh, dysphagia, weight loss, anemia, uh, abdominal pain that does not improve, uh, those folks can generally typically be uh, treated easily as an outpatient with acid-reducing medicines. Uh, I, I rarely prescribe proton pump inhibitors anymore because I'm asking them all to get them over the counter. Uh, let's, uh, uh, but but uh, certainly recommend them. Also recommend a lot of histamine receptor antagonists after they've been on them, trying to de-escalate medicines if we can. Upper GIs generally are not helpful. Um, I wouldn't do that for someone just with reflux to try to make that diagnosis, maybe for dysphagia, but not for reflux. Uh, pH monitoring, esophageal motility testing, leave that to the gastroenterologist. Uh, using prokinetics, uh, Reglan, uh, we, we, we kind of shied away from uh, more so than we probably should. It's generally an effective medication. I don't use sucralfate, except maybe in, uh, in pregnancy, and I, I do my best not to see pregnant women. Uh, surgery is, a, is an option for a lot of people with reflux. Uh, in the traditional fund application, and there's several different kinds of them, uh, honestly, I've got very skilled surgeons that I, that I refer to them uh, not infrequently. There are other types of fund application, something called a TIP. A transoral incisionless fundal application. This is something that's done generally by a, uh, a skilled surgeon or a gastroenterologist. No thank you. I'm not really interested in doing that myself. Usually if this is something that's done endoscopically with a stapling uh, procedure that will give a, a 270 degree wrap. Um, they, these things kind of come and go. It's not necessarily in favor uh, at the moment, but it is out there. There is something called the Lynx procedure, L-I-N-X. Uh, these are uh, titanium core um, uh, magnets uh, that wrap around the lower part of the esophagus. Actually, I've had a, a few patients that I've sent for this with very good results. So if somebody who really doesn't uh, have a high hernia, but uh, a lot of reflux symptoms, it's there to augment the lower esophageal, the lower esophageal sphincter. Don't worry about clopidogrel or Plavix uh, with proton pump inhibitors. That's, uh, that was uh, fashionable a couple of years ago. Uh, the information now is out that that is really not that important. Is anybody who's an ENT in the room? Okay, so we see a lot of uh, ENT uh, laryngoscopies that come back with erythema that, uh, that we, they're treating as reflux and we're treating as reflux, but not all of that is, is reflux. We do rely on our pulmonologists as well as our allergists uh, and um, uh, any ENT fellows as we take care of these problems. All right, reflux, dysphagia, the right answer on the test, a 34-year-old male with intermittent obstructive dysphagia, what do they have? Eosinophilic esophagitis, that's the thing that we are seeing, uh, I feel like, more and more uh, that the infiltration of the, uh, the entire esophagus actually with eosinophils uh, that's the, uh, what we're 
encompassing young men primarily. Uh, the other causes of, uh, of dysphagia anatomically are the strictures, the rings, and the webs. Uh, I will tell you that um, as, a, as a physician, um, my grandfather was a physician, my uncle was a physician, and, uh, but probably my, my grandmother who was the most influential person in my life for going into gastroenterology. I have a, uh, I'm the youngest of four children. Every Sunday we would come home uh, from church. We would have the two widow grandmothers sitting between the four children, my parents on the end of the table. My mother was a good southern woman. She would never let anybody leave the table until everybody was through. My grandmother ate one tea at a time. It was awful. When I was a teenager, all I wanted to do was just get outside. It was Sunday afternoon. My mother would never let me leave until everybody had finished. Finally, one day, one Sunday, things got stuck. She had to go to the emergency room. She had a Shotsky dream. And uh, I think she's been my, uh, she's been my uh, reason for being in gastroenterology. Does anybody chew their food 20 times? No. The person who said that clearly had a stretcher. Nobody chews their food 20 times uh, in, uh, in the United States or beyond. The differentiation for uh, dysphagia is, is it more with solids, is it more with liquids? If it's more with solids, those are probably going to have anatomic problems, strictures or rings. If it's more with liquids, then they're going to have uh, problems with esophageal motility. It's more of a motility disorder. The, um, uh, there's a condition called presbyesophagus that we see is, you know, anybody Presbyterian? You know that presby means elder. Uh, so presbyesophagus is generally something that we're seeing in, uh, in older folks. It's more of an ineffective esophageal motility uh, that those folks will present with uh, complaints of dysphagia. I love taking care of this problem. I love dilating uh, the esophagus. It is instant gratification. Uh, and um, and, and it's, it's, this is something that we can generally uh, make, uh, make good headway on uh, from a symptom standpoint. The motility disorder that we're all aware of is... What we know is achalasia. Um, we talk about it all the time. It's on every board examination. We see it infrequently. Uh, treatment can include Botox injection into the lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, but what they're doing incredibly now is something called POIN, per oral um, uh, esophageal um, um, myomectomy. And they are going through, actually, uh, with the scope, going between the mucosa and the submucosa through the esophagus down to the lower esophageal sphincter and cutting it. It is amazing. Um, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have it done to me. But the skill uh, that these guys possess and gals possess is amazing when they're, when they're doing that. Okay, Barrett's esophagus. Anybody from North Carolina? Nick Shaheen is a uh, is at Chapel Hill. Uh, is kind of the Barrett's esophagologist uh, at, th at this point. There was a guy also uh, from Wake Forest on Georgia Talk who uh, uh, named Joel Richter and Don Castell in the remote past who were both gastroenterologists. Don Castell has been down here uh, for a number of years, just retired this past year, but are the kind of the world-renowned esophagologists. Um, and Nick Shaheen is making his way in that too. In Barrett's esophagus, 10 to 15 percent of people with chronic reflux will have this. Uh, the big deal about Barrett's esophagus is I think most people know that it has the potential of increasing your risk for uh, adenocarcinoma of the, of the distal esophagus. Lots of classifications about how we should describe the uh, Barrett's esophagus when we see it as a, as, a, as a gastroenterologist. But when we take biopsy, it comes back as one of three things. Three things. No dysplasia, low-grade dysplasia, or high-grade dysplasia. The risk of you developing adenocarcinoma with low-grade dysplasia is about 0.2% per year. The risk of you developing adenocarcinoma if you have low-grade dysplasia is about 0.7% per year. If you have high-grade dysplasia, it's about 7% per year. So the, the treatment now is to ablate it, uh, not necessarily do surgery. They can take out small cancers now uh, endoscopically and then ablate it with regular frequency ablation. All right, so we talked about reflux. We talked about um, uh, Barrett's esophagus and dysphagia. Now we're going to move uh, southward into the stomach, and we're going to talk about dyspepsia. Dyspepsia used to be just anything referable to the upper uh, digestive tract. They sorted that out in something called the, the Rome classification, and dyspepsia is really based on epigastric pain. Then we get into something called functional dyspepsia. Functional dyspepsia is those people who've been investigated. If you've had an upper endoscopy, maybe an ultrasound, we don't see an ulcer, we don't see helicobacter, uh, then we call that functional dyspepsia. 75% of the people that present with dyspepsia, upper abdominal pain, are gonna we're going to find uh, 
find, uh, we're going to find that there's no obvious etiology to this. You mentioned um, uh, amitriptyline. Amitriptyline is something that can be used in dyspepsia. However, what we generally go through is the, uh, is the acid-reducing medicines and um, uh, generally the uh, uh, proton pump inhibitors, sometimes the histamine receptor antagonists to see if they get better. Also, test and treat for hemicobacter is also in order here. Anybody do breath tests? In their practice, the fecal uh, tests for helicobacter pylori, if they have this test, you go ahead and treat it. Uh, it, it uh, you're going to get some people better, not everybody. Helicobacter pylori, I mentioned that uh, uh, in, the, in the introduction. When I was in training and went to the national meetings, it seemed like 60% of the <coughs> talks were only about helicobacter. It was associated with everything back then. And indeed, the cohort of people that were born before 1930 had a lot more helicobacter than the cohort that's, uh, that was born uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. So a lot of people did have that. Uh, we don't see quite as much, though we still uh, continue to test for it often. The two physicians from Australia, a guy named Robin Warren, who's a pathologist, and, um, uh, and Barry Marshall, uh, discovered this in 1982. It took a while. They thought they were crazy. It took a while. Uh, before it really caught on that we know this is associated with duodenal ulcers. We know it's associated with gastric ulcers. We know it can be associated, at least epidemiologically, with gastric adenocarcinoma and a condition called MOF, mucosal associated lymphoid tumor, or tissue, excuse me. The, um, the incidence of helicobacter is higher outside of North, uh, North America than it is within North America. It is higher in lower socioeconomic uh, areas. We used to call it, does anybody remember what we used to call it when it first was described? Campylobacter-like organism. It was not until the uh, late 1990s, I believe, that they changed it over uh, to, uh, to helicobacter. If we, if we detect it, we treat it. Uh, the problem is now that there's going to be more chloridromycin-resistant disease with this. And, um, and I, I was talking to my infectious disease expert uh, this week and said, what is, our, what is the chloridromycin resistance uh, in our area? He said, oh, we don't know, somewhere around 15%. I don't think anybody's really studying it, but the, the problem is it is resistance. Uh, to the antibiotics. So typically we're using amoxicillin, fluoridomycin, and proton pump inhibitors for two weeks. Uh, there are rescue uh, drugs that can be used now, salvage drugs, including quadruple car therapy, that includes tetracycline, bismuth, and uh, uh, levofloxacin. Um, okay, a word about proton pump inhibitors. Talked about that at the beginning. It came out first as LOSEC. You may remember that. It, it was LOSEC 20 milligrams. And uh, the FDA made them change the name in 1990 to Prilosec uh, because it sounded too much like Lasix. And there was, uh, there was plenty of confusion uh, at, the, at the pharmacy. Lots of interest in terms of side effects. Uh, starting in the uh, 2004 or 5, they talked about hip fractures, uh, talked about pneumonias, talked about C. diff, all being related uh, to uh, the use of proton pump inhibitors. Also, more recently, it came out about dementia. Um, and, uh, and that has been debunked. So th these, these medications are safe. Uh, there was a question that Zoprazole may increase the amount of amyloid production and may decrease uh, the amount of the, 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 the vacuoles that uh, have, uh, possess proton pumps uh, that, may, that may decrease uh, an, an enzyme that breaks down amyloid. However, a uh, review of this, uh, it came out of a German study, uh, a Finnish study has been has, has looked at this. That there's no, there does not appear to be any relationship between dementia and proton pump inhibitor. So, you know, when you forget where your keys are, you know, don't say, "Oh my God, I took my Prilosec today." That must be the reason. <laughs> there are many reasons to use proton pump inhibitors. However, they are overused, uh, and, and I, I love the escalating uh, folks. I tell them, uh, you know, all these nice, nice people come to see me. Um, so why, I see that you're on uh, protonics or whatever, and they say, yeah, when, uh, how long have you been on it? Uh, five years. What happens if you miss a dose? I don't know. I'm going to miss a dose. Uh, and so I'll immediately, unless there's a very good indication, uh, immediately say, look, just take it every other day. See what happens. Uh, you'll know if, if, if you need it. And then and try to back them down from there, always trying to actually get them on um, uh, histamine receptor antagonists as well. So please feel confident and comfortable prescribing proton pump inhibitors to those who need it. But don't give it to those who don't. All right, shifting on through into the, um, uh, into the small intestine. We don't see the small intestine that well. I guess since, um, since I was talking about when I came around in training, the, the things that have come around from a, uh, a 
therapeutic standpoint as well as a uh, visualization standpoint, the small bowel capsule has given us vision into the small intestine more so than ever before. And so from an uh, endoscopy standpoint, that has helped. Uh, and, but, uh, and then I'll, I'll talk about a couple of other things, the biologics and, and more specifically a treatment for hepatitis C that have been the big uh, medicine uh, uh, breakthroughs in my opinion. Celiac disease, we look for it all the time. They say 1% of the population has it. Anybody who comes in with diarrhea, bloating, that you know, they were probably all called irritable bowel syndrome at one point. Uh, and then we are trying to uh, parse out those folks that, hey, you know, maybe you don't have irritable bowel syndrome, maybe you have celiac disease. You must pay attention more to your, uh, to your diet and, and things that may be triggering this. If you're on the West Coast, is anybody from the West Coast that live there? I think everybody probably has celiac disease, or at least everybody has gluten sensitivity, because I don't think that anybody eats uh, gluten in California. Uh, and so it, it is a reaction to, the, to wheat, barley, and rye. The gluten is the, is the protein that gives these grains their shape. It's kind of the glue, if you will, gluten, uh, that holds, uh, holds them together. Again, it's estimated that 1% of the population has it, more in Caucasian, more in Northern Europeans. Probably 6 to 7% of people do have something called non celiac gluten sensitivity. And so they, they come in, they say, look, every time I eat gluten, I, I, I feel bad, I, I, don't, I don't feel good, I'm bloating, I have diarrhea. And then we, we test them. Uh, the test is tissue transglutaminase, checking also with an IgA level, because 3 to 5% of people with celiac disease will be IgA deficient. So you, you need to check an IgA level 2 at that same time. Only about 1 in 500 people are IgA deficient ordinarily. So celiac disease does put you at, at risk for that. So it is an immunologic uh, type of, um, uh, of issue. If people come in and say, I feel bad when I eat gluten, but I say, well, you know, objectively, you don't have celiac disease based on doing a biopsy as well as um, uh, tissue transglutaminase, do I tell them to eat gluten? No, I mean, we just haven't figured out what those people have. Uh, so stay away from it. We'll, we'll come around and you, know, you guys will figure it out what they really have uh, at some point. Also remember, for board examinations, I don't know where all you guys are, but uh, if you cannot have celiac disease, if you don't have HLA, DQ2, and DQ8. So if all of a sudden you're really kind of trying to parse it out, that um, uh, if, if you want to prove they don't have it, 80% of the people don't have those two appetites, if you don't have it, then you don't have celiac disease. If you do have it, you may have celiac disease. All right. And if people don't get better on a gluten-free diet, then uh, there are some conditions that are associated with it, including intestinal uh, lymphoma as well as, a, as a intestinal adenocarcinoma. If they are on a gluten-free diet and they are good about it, within a few months, the, the duodenum looks totally normal histologically. And, uh, and the tissue transcontaminase does come back. So if you're on a gluten-free diet, uh, those numbers may be normal, don't be full. They, they certainly may have celiac disease. If you want to find out for sure, give them a gluten challenge and then, and then check those numbers. All right, uh, bacterial overgrowth, uh, again, kind of presenting uh, the same way. Oftentimes it is where you have an increase in, in uh, the colonic bacteria within the small intestine. It, they do compete for, uh, for nutrients. That's why people get bloating, that's why people get gas, that's why people have, have malabsorptions. Malabsorption. Nobody really cultures this. Uh, we, uh, we can do breath tests that may examine uh, with lac uh, lactulose or glucose that may give us uh, the diagnosis of a um, of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, but oftentimes this is just treated. Uh, we can treat it with a variety of antibiotics, more recently uh, rifaximin uh, may, may be a very good treatment for that, as well as, as um, uh, diarrhea predominant irritable, irritable bowel syndrome. All right, moving swiftly into the large intestine. Irritable bowel syndrome. Okay, so we, the Rome criteria, which I referred to about uh, dyspepsia, functional dyspepsia, also has really kind of honed in a little bit more on irritable bowel syndrome. The predominant symptom you must have to diagnose irritable bowel syndrome is pain. You have to have pain. You can't just have a bowel movement once a week uh, and have uh, um, diarrhea or excuse me, constipation predominant irritable bowel syndrome. You have to have pain that's associated with it along with a change in either the character of the stool, the frequency of the stool, or the pain improves with having a bowel movement. You must have pain three days, at least three days in a month for three months, which is pretty low pain fruit in terms of a, of a diagnosis, but that is the that is the strict criteria. 10 to 15% of people 
will be diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome or meet those criteria. When we diagnose, when we say IBSM, that's mixed. So if you have at least 25% constipation, 25% diarrhea, uh, then you, you fall in that category of, of IBSM, if you will. So low FODMAP diet, fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. Uh, that, that, is a, that diet is probably helpful not only for, uh, for celiac disease to some degree, but also with irritable bowel syndrome. Do we recommend psyllium and fiber? Yes. For uh, primarily for the diarrhea or b both ends of that spectrum, because psyllium, or psyllium, excuse me, or fiber is hydrophilic, loves water. So people with uh, watery loose bowel movements, it soaks up excess water, makes it a little bit more formed. People with really hard, dry, difficult to evacuate uh, bowel movements, it keeps water in the stool, makes it a little bit easier uh, to evacuate. We know of the medications uh, over the counter, the, the PEG agents, Miralax, etc., and then the. The um, uh, prescriptions, including uh, lubiprostone uh, or anatiza, uh, linactylide, uh, placanatide, which are which are the uh, guanyl cyclase uh, agonists uh, used for constipation. Honestly, uh, from a from a practice standpoint, I'm going to use more of the uh, the Miralax uh, than the uh, than the prescriptions, mostly because the uh, prescriptions are extremely expensive, and a somewhat variable response, uh, but uh, but certainly worth using. Anybody in South Carolina physician, you may have seen, and, and talking uh, back, um, uh, the PDMP came out on my uh, phone yesterday, uh, the uh, prescription drug monitoring program, to let me know that as a gastroenterologist, I have one patient that I do give uh, pain medicine to for osteonecrosis of her hips, uh, and, um, but also uh, the medication Viverzi put you on that list because it is a uh, it is a new opioid receptor agonist and that is the that is the medication that is used for IBSD, IBS uh, diarrhea. And uh, so in any event it all of a sudden gets on your list then. All right, so when you refer people with irritable bowel syndrome, uh, if, if they have a long symptoms, weight loss, uh, blood in the stool is more than just trivial, uh, and um, uh, or iron deficiency. And those are the people that do need to be paid attention to, but this can be a clinical diagnosis, especially in the, in the demographic group that is most typical in, which is, uh, which is young people, predominantly female. All right, Clostridium difficile, clearly a big problem since the turn of the century. We've had more and more problems with the virulence uh, and uh, in treating, as well as the, uh, the number of, of episodes that we're seeing. There's no perfect test, but if you're in the hospital now and seeing patients, Boy, how easy is it to order those panels, those uh, nucleic acid uh, tests that will that give you 20 different uh, stools? I, you know, it's probably not. I mean, actually, it may be cost effective uh, at some point. Um, uh, the insurance company may or may not like it, but it's easy to order. Now, what those do is they overdiagnose C. Diff, okay, so that's what you have to be careful with. That's when measuring the toxin uh, if for people who are positive. Uh, may be in order. So if they're, if they're having more than three watering bowel movements a day, certainly a reasonable thing to do, especially if they have an antibiotic history. Uh, but be careful on the, on the test you order. Uh, you're going to overdiagnose with the, with the NATS, the, the nucleic acid amplification test, and maybe need to be backed up um, uh, with, uh, with the toxin test as well. Don't repeat test. Uh, don't, uh, don't repeat if it's positive uh, for cure. Uh, you're not, uh, that's, they, they may, it may still be uh, flying around in there. Metronidazole, if somebody's got a lot of diarrhea, but they're, they're, you know, they're not sick, you might can use it, but a lot, of the, a lot of the algorithms are going away from that. They're going straight to either uh, vancomycin uh, or uh, Diposid, uh, the, uh, the, vaxima, uh, the vaxamycin. And, um, and then now there is a new medication out uh, that's been introduced. It's been around maybe, maybe for a year. It's in Plow, you may have seen it uh, or may have heard of it. Uh, it is a, uh, uh, a monoclonal antibody that you give for recurrence. Um, I think um, if, you take, if you take five packages of, of uh, uh, Zimplava to your Chevrolet dealership, you should be able to trade them in for a topic. Okay, so just uh, keep that in mind. If you ever get samples, maybe you can go barter uh, downtown at the um, uh, at the uh, store at, the, at the, the car dealership. Do I stop proton pump inhibitors uh, people with uh, clostridium? Yeah, I mean if I can, if they're not on for a good reason uh, because of the association, 
And, and I think that's just, uh, that just makes to me uh, just a reasonable, reasonable sense. Okay, and lastly, I'm pretty involved with this. I want to brag on South Carolina. We've had a pretty good program. Uh, there's 160 gastroenterologists in the state. About half of us participate uh, in the South Carolina Colon Cancer Prevention Network, which offers screening colonoscopy for, uh, for folks that are out of the free medical clinics, and this is done all around the state. So I've had some involvement with it, along with the USC Center for Colon Cancer uh, Research. Um, 140,000 people are still diagnosed with colon cancer. 50,000 will die. Uh, proportionally in, the, in, in South Carolina, we're, we're the same. Uh, there are uh, screening options, but here are the two things I want you to remember. Now, I'm self-serving, I'm a gastroenterologist, I get it, okay? Colonoscopy is clearly the gold standard. If you get people to do that, there's not a reason not to do one. Do one in their, in their, in their 50s. And if, you're, if they totally refuse, uh, there's a good reason not to do it. Do a fit test. We're, you're seeing the Colonard advertised. It, uh, Colonard is a fit test that's jazzed up to some degree with DNA sampling as well. So when you get this positive test, it doesn't tell you which one's positive. It just says positive. Uh, the, this, this test, I'll call and ask about it. Y'all may know exactly how much it costs, but it's $650. Uh, and, and then that all of a sudden it puts people in a, no longer a screening category, and, and unfortunately sometimes you're playing insurance games. Now they've had a positive stool test, so it's not, it's not as much screening as it is, quote, diagnostic. But, uh, I encourage spit tests if people are not going to have a colonoscopy and respond to that, but you have to do them how often? Annually. You can't do one and done with a spit test. But if you have a normal colonoscopy by somebody who does it every day, you get a very good examination, they have a very good prep, it's a durable test. It's a 10-year test. Uh, are there animal cancers? Yes. It's the thing that scares us more than anything. Uh, have we all had it? Yes. I mean, do we do this every day? Yes. Is colonoscopy perfect? No. Uh, but it is, it is clearly the best test. There's, a, there's an emphasis called 80 by 18, trying to screen 80% of uh, the at-risk population, which is over the age of 50. Um, by, the year, by the end of this year, we're, uh, lots of states are, have reached that. We're close, uh, probably not there to be perfectly fine. Um, when do we stop doing cold mouse? When do we stop screening? <clears throat> the, um, the U.S., the United States Preventive Services Task Force is the, is the group that the insurance companies are going to go by. You do know that in May, you may have heard, that the American Cancer Society recommended that the screening uh, age go from 50 down to 45. I'll be honest, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that. I don't necessarily agree with the colonoscopy beginning at 45, though, as a self-serving gastroenterologist, I would say, hey, that's a great idea. Uh, <laughs> those that probably, maybe, maybe stool testing, on those fit testing on people in their, in their 40s, African-Americans, uh, the American College of Gastroenterology does recommend that African-Americans should be screened at age 45. So, uh, and that's, uh, you know, we, we, we've got to come somewhere, you know, we got, and so at least the, the drumbeat is generally 50, uh, there are um, uh, groups that need to be screened at different, at different times. The, the general uh, rule is that if you have a first degree relative, parent or sibling, who's under the age of 60, uh, that has had colon cancer diagnosed before that age, you need to be screened, that first degree relative needs to be screened beginning at 40, and then every five years. If, a, if there's somebody who's over the age of 60, and you know, the gastroenterologists, when we, we're we're involved in something called GI Quick, which is this um, benchmarking um, registry where they look at adenoma detection rate, sequel intubation rate, quality of preps, intervals that you're that you're performing procedures, and we, and we, we pay very strong attention to that, uh, and um, and we try to be very careful on when we're recommending uh, repeat examinations of folks. Um, but uh, you know, you want somebody who's doing this uh, to be doing it, um, uh, be doing it every day. But it's the United States Preventive Services Task Force that the insurance companies follow. So you're not, if you're, if you're dealing with, uh, especially with uh, private paid uh, folks, they're probably not necessarily going to jump on the age 45 thing at this point. Maybe at some point uh, they will. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm quick in at least recommending uh, stool testing on those who are at low risk uh, and below the age of 50. But clearly, the incidence of colon cancer is going down. I was saying 10 years ago, 140,000 people a year were being diagnosed with colon cancer and 50,000 were dying. I said that 10 years ago. Those numbers have not changed. 
What's changed is the denominator of people that we're talking about. So the incidence is going down, the wrong numbers, if you will, are staying almost uh, identical, but as we're seeing the, the baby boomers come through, we are clearly, it is a, it is a public health um, uh, success story, uh, the, the screening uh, at this point. All right, briefly about the liver. Woo, all right, it is. What did I say, 218 when we started? It's 255 now, all right. So, um, you don't stop now? I don't like the liver that much either, I mean, I can stop now. <laughs> All right, abnormal liver chemistries. And, and really, I think I'm going to tell you a story as much as, as, much as anything. I got called uh, from a physician down on the coast. And he said, hey, March, um, I've got a, a friend whose son is up in Carolina. He's a patient of mine. Um, and, and she sent me his liver function test. And I need for you to see it. And they, they faxed me the copy. I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll send it for him. And, uh, and his AST and ALT were like eight and 900. Uh, everything else was really pretty normal. I said, you know, college student, eh, probably got into something. And so I saw him the next day, and, and we talked, and, um, and I said, well, you know, kind of tell me about any, any college student, any substance? He says, well, you know, I smoke a little weed, not uh, much, and, you know, drink some. I said, well, anything else? I said, no, no. He said, um, and then I started talking. I said, well, what keeps you busy? He said, man, I have, my brother and I went and, we were doing this PX90 thing. I am dying. And the guy had rabbit. Uh, he had an old crack in uh, But his ASD and ALT were markedly elevated. Uh, and uh, you know, after having a conversation with him, I said, oh my gosh, you don't have little problems at all. You got, you got rabbit. And, uh, and I said, look, you got to start drinking. Uh, I mean, water. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, it's kind of a, a fun diagnosis. Of course, you know, what, what, we're gonna, what we're finding now with elevated transaminases, uh, uh, most uh, specifically now, is what? Fatty liver. 40% to maybe 60% of people have fatty liver on the imaging studies now in, in, the, in the United States. It's, you know, it's, it's crazy. That is the now the holy grail in terms of, of liver disease, which is the NASH, NAPL, fatty liver. Steatic hepatitis. We all look for the usual suspects uh, with abnormal chemistries, the, uh, the viral serologies, looking for autoimmune diseases, the, uh, for um, autoimmune hepatitis, and then the metabolic causes. Uh, though unusual, hemochromatosis don't, don't begin, especially in men, uh, unusual to see Wilson's disease uh, with the, uh, with the uh, cerebral plasma. So usually it's going to be, if, if you don't find any other reason, it's going to be steatosis, steatic hepatitis. Unusually, celiac disease can also cause actually elevated liver enzymes. All right, so fatty liver and NASH, a minute about that. Clearly, the big thing that we're seeing in, in liver disease today, only because we know how to do, take care of the next slide uh, that I'll show you in just a minute. It's associated with diabetes, it's associated with obesity, it's associated with hyperlipidemia, it can be associated with neuro. We don't know exactly what turns the liver on when fat gets in there, that it can, it can stay just indolent and all you have is steatosis with fatty liver on imaging studies, but normal, uh, normal liver enzymes, but then something turns it on uh, to where you start that inflammatory process and then, and then ultimately fibrosis. This is, this is one of the leading causes now of liver transplant in the United States, and it, is, it will be the leading cause uh, soon. Now, the reason is that is this. Hepatitis C, as I indicated, the, we, we determined the virus in, uh, in around, right around 1990. So that, after that, the most prolific way of it being transfused before that, for you younger folks, was what? Blood transfusions. Okay, so we did non-A, non-B, hepatitis is what us, more mature people knew it uh, in, uh, when we were coming through medical school and training. 1990, we figured that out, so it, was, it got out of the blood supply. Uh, so then uh, the, the risk is, uh, is during intravenous drug use, tattoos, viscous sex uh, is, uh, is the main uh, ways of transmission uh, now. Probably 4 million people in the United States have this. This is well over 1%. And if you're seeing somebody that you have these abnormal liver function tests, and oh, by the way, the CDC has come out saying that all baby boomers should be tested on them. Um, I think if you were a stockholder in one of the companies that's come out with these really nice drugs, I think you probably endorse that idea. Um, but um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a policymaker. Um, but I tell you, we're, we're treating a lot of people. 20%, and, and because the numbers are this 20% of people with hepatitis C will go on to get cirrhosis. 8% won't. Not everybody 
goes over to cirrhosis. Um, and then of that 20%, 20% of that, or 5%, will die of either hepatocellular carcinoma uh, or um, uh, varices or some other complication. So it's still not everybody with hepatitis C is due to dying of any stage of liver disease. So testing for it is, is really pretty easy now. It's just uh, it's the, the viral load, the genotype. Uh, we don't do that many liver biopsies anymore. We used to because we want to determine what stage of fibrosis it was in uh, before we subjected these people to treatment. In the 1990s, our treatment it was milk thistle and interferon in these bizarre doses. It was, you know, it's either three million units three times a week, five million units seven days a week, uh, and, and people were sick and nobody got better. I mean, nobody got rid of it. Of the, uh, of the virus. There will be a small subset, subset, maybe 10, maybe a little bit more percent, who will be antibody positive, but viral load negative. So they, something in their immunity, and that's, those are the people that we probably need to study uh, and, and find out what their body's doing. But those are the people that did get infected, but cleared it spontaneously. So it's a, it's a minority, but it's not zero. The, um, if, if people do have cirrhosis, uh, then, then we need to screen those people periodically with uh, ultrasound uh, and alpha feed of protein looking for hepatocellular carcinoma. And generally it's recommended an upper endoscopy every, every two years or so to look uh, for uh, significant parasites. I was telling you, and I didn't go into treatment of uh, fatty liver. Treatment is extraordinarily disappointing in fatty liver um, because it's, it's trying to control whatever risk factors may be there. But Vitamin E doesn't work. There's a medicine called albuticolic acid that has now been introduced. It, it, it is, might be, it will, it's effective in certain people with uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, but this may be something that we will be seeing in, um, uh, in um, fatty liver as well. Uh, again, you can take a few bottles down to your car dealership and trade it in uh, for a car uh, for, the, for the treatment cost. Treatment now for hepatitis C is amazing. It is amazing how satisfying it is if you're treating this disease. Now, who are we treating? I mean, the people who get hepatitis C, um, you know, they're, they, uh, it's, a, it's a lifestyle, I mean, let's face it, it's a lifestyle uh, infection for, for the most part. Uh, but, um, but now we are eradicating all genotypes. Uh, genotype 1 is the most common in the United States uh, and in South Carolina. Uh, but uh, but with now with 12 weeks of therapy, uh, whether it's the, the trade names of Pepluza, uh, or Harbani uh, or Maverick, uh, they are, they're all very effective. Now, I will say, and, and, and I don't mind talking about this because this, this burns me up and I'll, I'll, I'll rail into the, um, uh, to the uh, folks that, that the, the pharmaceutical representatives that come into the office. I'll say, I, I really enjoyed your lunch, but the, um, when Harbani came out, anybody know, anybody remember the cost? 80 something grand. It's a thousand dollars a pill. A thousand dollars a pill. And you know, I'm sorry. That is horribly insulting to to me, and, and I suspect you, uh, when um, uh, you know when all of a sudden the Medicare and insurance companies are saying, "Oh, here, you know, sorry, we're, we're having an update uh, on your on your fee schedule," and whatever. and um, and then uh, then um, um, uh, Advi came out with Matt. Maverick was uh, equally effective. Harbonne was one pill a day. Anybody work with Gilead, by the way? I'm going to say that. Um, Harbonne was one pill a day. Maverick was three pills a day. Equally effective. Maverick was one third of the cost. I mean, $23,000. Um, and, uh, and I called up Blue Cross Blue Shield. I said, I'm going to tell you, if you do not switch, because y'all will tell me how much somebody's paying for these. I'm sure it's not $86,000, by the way. Um, I said, if you don't switch, then I know y'all being paid by these drug companies. And so they, they did. <laughs> so, and I'm going to tell. <laughs> so, well, they, they paid for both of them. And, and, and again, this is way off topic, and I'm sure Don's getting ready to say, stop talking. No, keep going. No. So it's the, it's, the, it's the pharmacy benefit managers. Those are the things that are killing us uh, in, terms of, in terms of cost of health care. It's not us who, who are working very hard every day. Uh, it is the... Uh, it is, it is pharmacy benefit managers that are squeaking all every last nickel. And I'm, I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody who works for them or whatever. So. All right. So, but in any event, the results for everybody to see are amazing. Never did I think in my practice lifetime 
Never did I think of the Pentecost lifetime that I will see, potentially see the end of hepatitis C. I mean, that, it, is, it is truly amazing. And, let's, uh, and, and I'd be really miffed if, uh, if, people get, if people get reinfected, I think you get one chance if I'm paying for your medicine. But, uh, but don't, get, don't get reinfected. Okay, so yeah, the results are great. Uh, the cost is equally uh, amazing. Um, okay, so I was told I have some, some questions. And so, so if you're listening, if you're listening, okay. <laughs> so that's the end. I don't know if you're real. I'll, I'll go with So dysphagia primarily to liquids alone is more indicative of a motility disorder than an, an anatomic narrowing of the esophagus. True. True. Right. Most people diagnosed with dyspepsia will either have an ulcer or a helicobacter pylori. False. 75% won't have any one of those. Small bowel mucosa will be histologically normal in patients with celiac disease that maintain a gluten-free diet. True. Good. The incidence of colorectal cancer is decreasing in every age group. False. Going up in young people. In the United States, the new hepatitis C medications are no more than 80% effective for eradicating the virus. Fox is 98%. It is amazing. It is amazing. Um, all right. And that's it. That's it. <laughs>